Hey, what's up you lot, Path here, and in this two-part mini-series, we will be looking at something that Einstein was very, very wrong about, aka the most important discovery in quantum mechanics, aka Bell's theorem. In this particular video, we will be focusing on a paradox that Einstein and a couple of his colleagues thought they had uncovered. If you enjoyed this video, then please hit the thumbs up button and subscribe to my channel for more fun physics content. I've also got a Patreon page now on which I'll be posting video solutions to documents that accompany my videos, which contain example questions for you to have a go at after watching my videos. Also, yes, before all of you comment, I do have a goatee now. Let's avoid that and let's get into the video. Around the time that quantum mechanics was taking off, there was a bloke. I think he was like semi-famous or something. Some of you might have heard of him. His name was Albert Einstein. He was one of the physicists that contributed a lot to the beginnings of quantum theory, especially with his Nobel Prize winning paper on the photoelectric effect, which essentially explained how light could behave as a particle, even though most scientists around the time thought that light behaved as a wave. However, he didn't really like where quantum theory was headed. So him and a couple of other people who were hacked off with all this probabilistic weirdness came together and wrote a paper. In this paper, Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen looked at one particular aspect of quantum mechanics, quantum entanglement. This is the idea that quantum particles that are entangled will essentially behave as one big system. And say, for example, a measurement made on one of the particles in the entangled system will affect the entire system and therefore the other particle as well. Crucially, quantum mechanics suggests this will happen even if the particles are very far apart from each other and this has some interesting implications. I've already made a video about quantum entanglement on my channel, so do check it out up here if you're interested. Anyway, so in this paper that Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen, or EPR, wrote, they basically showed the ludicrousness of quantum entanglement. Or so they thought. They especially had a problem with the idea that in an entangled state, if we were to make a measurement on one of the particles, then we would have immediate instant knowledge about the other particle, thereby causing a collapse of the wave function of this quantum system. To them, this seemed like instantaneous communication, the idea that we could know something about a particle that was very, very far away instantly without even having to wait for light to come from that particle and reach us, simply because we'd made a measurement on the particle near us. This scientific paper that they wrote, therefore, brought up the EPR paradox. To understand the EPR paradox, we first need to understand the assumptions that EPR made in their scientific paper about our universe. They assumed local realism. Locality is this idea that, say, two particles are separated by a large distance in space. They cannot instantaneously communicate with each other because it takes time for the information from one particle to reach the other, and this is restricted to traveling at the speed of light at most. And this assumption actually makes a lot of sense, given how successful Einstein was with his theories of relativity, which, which made the same assumption. We'll come back to the meaning of realism in just a second. But before we do, I want to take a moment to thank this video's sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community where you can find a large number of inspiring classes, focusing on topics such as productivity and lifestyle, to building a career or business, to learning creative skills in areas like music, film, and web development. As many of you all know, I'm a huge advocate of having multiple passions in life, and I've taken a few classes on Skillshare that have been genuinely eye-opening to me. For example, I took a class called Simple Productivity, How to Accomplish More with Less by Greg McEwan and he provided some simple and easily actionable ways in which we can boost productivity. Skillshare has a large number of classes to choose from, and it's all about learning, so there are no adverts. Most classes are less than an hour long, which means it's not a major commitment to sit down and learn something new. And Skillshare costs less than $10 a month when you get an annual subscription. However, the first 1,000 people to click the Skillshare link in the description below will get two months for free. Big thanks again to Skillshare for sponsoring this video let's take a look at how quantum theory dealt with entangled particles. As we've already mentioned, quantum mechanics suggested that making a measurement on one of the entangled particles would immediately cause a change, a collapse of the wave function, if you will, for the second particle also. However, interestingly, quantum mechanics suggests that before we made any measurement on any of the particles, the system was in a sort of blend, a sort of superposition of all the different states it could be found in when we were to make a measurement on that system. This is important because this is slightly different to our quantum system already being in a particular state, and we just don't know what that state is until we make a measurement on that system. Those are two distinct ideas. This quantum mechanical idea that our system was in a blend of various different experimental results, essentially, until we made a measurement on it, I've discussed this idea multiple times in previous videos, and quite frankly, Einstein hated it. 
He called it spooky action at a distance, because supposedly a measurement on one particle could suddenly affect the other one as well. This is because entangled particles are described by the same wave function in quantum mechanics, and they're essentially behaving like one big system. Now, I suppose at this point you might be thinking, how can we tell the difference between a system that's in a blend of states before we make a measurement and then collapses into a state when we make that measurement, and a system that simply happens to be in a particular state that we don't know yet, and we just find out what that state is when we make the measurement? Well, EPR actually suggested this second idea as a plausible explanation for what's going on with these weird states. We'll understand this in more detail shortly, but first let's remember that we haven't talked about realism yet. Realism, sometimes interchangeably called determinism, is this idea that if we've got a system and we have all possible information that we can have about this system, then we'll be able to work out exactly how it behaves as time progresses. All of physics was deterministic up until quantum mechanics came in and ruined the party. Newton's laws of motion assumed, for example, that if we knew the mass of an object and we knew the force that was being exerted on that object, then we could precisely and accurately calculate the acceleration of that object. Or, for example, if we had a box containing a lot of gas molecules. Let's say we knew their exact positions, velocities, and masses at one point in time, then we should be able to calculate exactly how the gas looks at some later point in time. It's also worth noting here that this seeming lack of realism or determinism in quantum mechanics is what brings in this whole argument about consciousness being important to our universe, and without consciousness nothing exists because who's there to measure things and who's there to observe the universe. Some scientists believed that this is exactly what was happening. Other scientists believed that it was the actual interaction between the measurement device and the system that we happen to be measuring that was causing the collapse of the wave function. And this is still a hotly debated topic. But it has also meant that people have taken this consciousness idea into the realm of pseudoscience. My advice to you is to always be wary of someone who definitively tells you that consciousness is the key to the universe. We don't know that that's true yet. So if somebody suggests that that is 100% the case, yeah. Anyway, coming back to EPR's problem with quantum mechanics. Now, if we imagine that these two particles in the quantum entangled state are separated far enough from each other that it takes light a considerable amount of time to get from one to the other, then this instantaneous collapse supposedly breaks locality. Also, this idea that the system collapsed into a particular state when we made a measurement and it had some amount of randomness as to which state it collapsed into, really didn't work with realism or determinism. Their whole argument was that the universe seemed to be local and deterministic, and quantum mechanics broke these. So, WTF. This is how they justified to other scientists that quantum mechanics must be wrong. We now know that they were wrong, at least partially if not completely. Let's once again imagine that we're measuring the spin of, say, an electron. We've already said that the two measurement results we could find are spin up and spin down. But what I haven't mentioned yet is that we measure the spin of a particle in a particular direction. There's a reason spins are given arrows to describe them, because they are vectors. Essentially what we're choosing to do is to measure the spin of an electron, say, in the upward direction. And we will always find the spin of an electron to either be pointing in that same direction or pointing exactly against it. That's just how spin behaves. We're not going to go into too many details about spin. Check out this video if you haven't seen it already. But the important thing is that we have some way of measuring something about our system. And we make a measurement in a particular direction. Now, why can't we say that this system, this electron, is already in, say, the spin-up state before we make a measurement, and then as soon as we make a measurement, we just find out that it's in the spin-up state? Well, EPR believe this to be true. The issue that they had to resolve came up when we had to measure the spin of this electron in different directions. Now let's say that the particle spin before we made a measurement was just in the spin up direction, and we chose to make a measurement in, say, this direction. What would we find as our experimental result? Would we measure aligned or anti-aligned? And this is where we see two conflicting hypotheses about how the system may behave. One was quantum mechanics, and the other one was the one laid out by EPR. Quantum mechanics suggested that measuring in a different direction would not be a problem because we could easily just write a spin up state as some linear combination of a spin right and a spin left state. And then we could work out the probability of finding spin right and the probability of finding spin left and it would just fall into one of these two states with their given probabilities. EPR suggested something different. EPR suggested that there was something built into the system, something that we couldn't access. Maybe due to our lack of understanding, maybe because that's just how the universe was. And this thing that was built into our system would tell the system what result to display when we made a measurement on it. 
This weird inaccessible thing later went on to be called a hidden variable. And this was important for EPR because this did not break their assumption of determinism. If there was something hidden away in the system that we couldn't access, that resulted in the system giving particular results for particular measurement axes for particular times, then it's perfectly deterministic. There's no random collapse of the wave function going on. Locality is a little bit more of a difficult topic to discuss here, but the hidden variable theory that they came up with did not break determinism. One of their main problems with quantum mechanics was, of course, this probabilistic collapse. We couldn't know exactly which state the system would collapse into. We could only work out the chances of it collapsing into a particular state. So, at this point, we have two competing hypotheses for what might be going on. Which one happens to be correct? The weird new one that seems to be going against everything physicists knew up until that point, or the one that sort of seemed to preserve the status quo and was designed by three very clever scientists, one of whom was Albert Einstein. With all that being said, I'm going to finish up here. If you enjoyed the video, please do hit the thumbs up button and subscribe to my channel for more fun physics content. And feel free to hit the bell button as well if you'd like to be notified when I upload. Please also check out my Patreon page if you'd like to support me on there and get access to the video solutions I'll be creating for the worksheets that'll be accompanying most of my videos. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you for part two of this discussion where we'll be finding out who was right, quantum mechanics or EPR. I will see you really soon.